We decided to write The Tea Party Goes to Washington because so many people talk about the Tea Party and say, oh, what do they stand for? Who are they? Are they angry about something? And I tell people the one unifying thing about the Tea Party is that these are people who are concerned about the debt. They're concerned about passing this debt on to their kids and their grandkids. And they're concerned that we're accumulating so much debt that it really imperils our economy. It's making it harder for young people to get jobs. And that really we just can't continue on the way we have been. We're, we really have to wake up and do something before it's too late. Senator Paul, what do you think is the best way that we can reform Social Security? The best way to reform Social Security, I guess, is to admit that it's broken is the first thing. Many on the other side are not admitting that it's broken, but it is uh, profoundly broken. We now spend more than we bring in, and it's also broken for two main reasons. We're living longer, and uh, we have a lot less workers and more retirees because of a lot of babies being born right after World War II. So ideally, the young people come to me, they say, you know what, I'd just like to opt out. They'd like to get their money out of Social Security. Um, I think that would be great if we could do that. We proposed an interim solution that really didn't address privatization but talks about allowing the age to rise gradually and then having some means testing on the benefits, which means that uh, the more you made in your career, you will have to give up some of the benefits. And that does make it sound for 75 years. But really, ultimately, that's not even completely satisfying to many people who would really like to see it privatized. And we will probably have separate legislation where we talk about trying to encourage and make the laws easier for people to set up private accounts as well. The Tea Party was very influential in the 2010 elections, only to see many of the Tea Party-supported candidates co-opted by the GOP and basically swallowed up by the establishment. What specifically can you point to in your character that will keep that from happening to you? I think one of the things you can see already about many of us up here is that we're already transforming things. You know, they say that uh, many of those up here said that they were going to co-opt us, and really even before we were sworn in in January, we uh, had them uh, changing their mind and changing their tune on earmarks. We now have Republicans who have voluntarily agreed not to do uh, earmarks. You've seen at least from our office five-year balanced budgets the best balanced budget amendment to the Constitution that's probably ever been proposed up here. So we're very much, uh, you know, action-oriented and results-oriented. So I think you can already see in the first four months that there's no backing down from the rhetoric we had on the campaign. And uh, I don't think we've had anybody really questioning our resolve as far as sticking to our principles. Hello, Senator Paul. Do you see the Tea Party moving in a more humble foreign policy direction, a more liberty-oriented direction in the coming year? Well, I think there are some of us who believe that and who believe in a non-interventionist foreign policy and who think that uh, in order to ultimately find the compromise on spending, that it will include cutting some military spending and addressing our foreign policy. Um, are we a majority of the Tea Party? I, you know, I think that's hard to tell exactly. I'd say the Tea Party is divided. There are some who have just sort of a traditional uh, approach and say, oh, we can't cut anything from military and we need to be everywhere all the time. But then there are some who hearken back to Taft and others who talk about more humble foreign policy, less intervention, and one that can save also some money for us. So I think there is a division. There are also people who, just simply because of how bad our fiscal problems are, are starting to wake up to it, be, that weren't with us necessarily before, but are gradually coming our way. And the thing is, is you know, really there's a couple of things that really point towards why you have to. If you do nothing, within about a decade, entitlements and interest consume the whole budget, and there's no money left for national defense. So I tell those who want to uh, have a good, strong national defense, and I'm one of them, that you won't be able to have it at all if we continue along this spending pattern. And I think they're starting to, to accept that more and more. And, and uh, members are quietly coming up to me, members of the Senate and of the House, and saying, you're right, we will have to eventually address our foreign policy and our military spending. But we're not there yet. We probably are still a minority within the Republican caucus and maybe a minority in the Tea Party, but that's another reason why because the Tea Party has no set platform, 
if you continue to participate, you get out there and become part of the leadership, you become part of creating what the Tea Party platform actually becomes. Senator Paul, first I want to thank you for all the work you do to promote liberty in the Constitution. Secondly, I want to say while I wholeheartedly agree with you upon the principles in which you've written the right to work legislation, my question for you is this. Does the federal government have the constitutional authority to write such legislation, or does it violate the Tenth Amendment? Thank you. Right. You know, I think with the, particularly with the Boeing situation, I think it's, it's very clear that we can't allow the federal government to get involved and say to companies they can't relocate into right-to-work states. Whether right-to-work is a state issue or a federal issue, it has become a federal issue because the federal laws, um, the laws that restri restrict and restrain labor contracts are federal laws. So really, that's why you end up having right-to-work uh, legislation, or you may have it eventually at the national level, because the laws restricting and uh, contracts between labor and management are done at the federal level. Now, ideally, there shouldn't be any federal legislation that deals with contracts, and those would be entirely state issues. But because the federal government's been involved since the 30s, in order to try to get rid of some of the federal government overreach, there are also federal solutions. But also, even if you disagree with me on that, you should wholeheartedly be supporting right to work within the states because those are the states that are thriving right now. 1.8 million jobs have been created in right to work states. In the same period of time, 1.5 million jobs have been lost in union states. So it's, it's definitely the way to go. Hi, Rand Paul. My name is Sarah True. I sustained a spinal cord injury over 18 years ago. I now have a bachelor's degree in microbiology and love to work. Yet, I'm not covered most often under other insurance companies and have been in the Medicaid Medicare system since the age of 18. It is difficult to get a job right now in these times and the work I do is mostly independent. Um, I am wondering what you're offering, what options uh, can you foresee or do you have for those of us with significant disabilities trapped in this oppressive Medicaid Medicare system where they closely monitor your income and threaten to kick you out of this system at any uh, amount of work that you do and this is the only way I have things such as catheters and durable medical covered and without catheters I cannot pee yet without work I cannot pay my bills I would love to be able to afford my durable medical somehow and be set free from the restraints of the Medicare Medicaid system and gain my independence. What options do you have for those of us in this situation? That's a good question. It's also a very, very difficult question to, to come up with an answer for. Part of the answer, I think, is that pre-existing conditions if we had long-term insurance, like, you know, when you buy health insurance as a young person, if you can get it before you've had an injury, uh, life insurance or health insurance, before you have gotten diagnosed with a disease or had a, a life-changing injury like you've had, then your insurance would go on for long periods of time. For example, I have a 20-year life insurance policy, and if, I'm, if I had a spinal cord injury, or got diabetes or heart disease in the next year or two, my life insurance doesn't change cost, it's in my name, and I get it every year based on my age but not based on my health. What we need to try to do is develop health insurance that way where you can get on health insurance early on where your health insurance then sticks with you and is in your name over many years and then if you should become injured or get cancer or get something that becomes very expensive to take care of, they, your contract is a multi-year contract and all you have to do is keep paying the same rate. Uh, what we have now though is a lot of times is your rate is dependent on, on um, your health and then what happens is that when you get sick your rates go up. Now in some places if you work for a big business, for example, and this may not work for you, but if you were working for a big corporation within about 60 days, they would end up covering you, but your circumstances may be that you can't go into a big corporation and work there that has good insurance. You may need to work from home, and that does make it more difficult. Now, there may be some corporations, though, that if you're going to be doing phone calling or writing from home, 
that if you were able to get employment with, with one of these after about 60 days, some of the pre-existing condition uh, requirements might fall away. But the actual specifics on that of how it would work is, a, I, you know, not something I, I can probably give you an answer to. But what I would say is that we need to try to develop insurance that's multi-year that allows us to purchase it as a young person and it's based more on age and less on the health uh, of the individual. But it's a good question and a difficult area. And one of the things that if we, if we, if Obamacare gets overturned, we can rehab that debate up here. And I think the last time around there wasn't anybody really talking about some of these long-term solutions to uh, how we might fix health care without more government. Congratulations to Sarah for winning the contest, the Tea Party Goes to Washington contest. We'll be sending you a uh, signed copy of the book, and we really appreciate everybody's involvement with this, and we're excited about trying to transform Washington and fix the problems we've got up here.